I'd like walk in this door and I felt this like weight just be put onto my shoulders. You're not good enough to be in this family. You're a failure to them. You shouldn't be alive anymore. Just end it all and save them. Hey there, my name is Sean and this is Suicide Noted. On this podcast, I talk with suicide attempt survivors so that we can hear their stories. Every year around the world, millions of people try to take their own lives. We almost never talk about it. We certainly don't talk about it enough. And when we do talk about it, many of us, including me, we're not very good at it. So one of my goals with this podcast is to have more conversations and hopefully better conversations with attempt survivors. Now, if you are a suicide attempt survivor and you would like to talk, please reach out. Hello at SuicideNoted.com, on Facebook or Twitter, at Suicide Noted, and you can check the show notes for an additional way you can reach out, more information on sponsoring and supporting this podcast, and our mission, which is to help more people in more places feel a little less shitty and a little less alone, ways you can volunteer, and of course... Our membership program, I want to thank Margaret and Carla and Audrey and Sharon who recently joined us. I want to thank anybody who's given a donation via the Red Circle platform, which is where we host the podcast. Did you not give me your names? But hey, you know who you are. Thanks very much. And of course, those of you that are in the uh, recently formed group on Signal, thanks for joining. Thanks for trusting. There's a lot of thanks going around today, like all of you who listen. And those of you who have given us reviews, especially the five-star ones and the ratings, we love it. And if you're interested in that membership program, there is a link in the show notes towards the top. Check it out. Have a look. Have a read. If you're interested, if you're able to do it and you have the means, we'd love your support and we need it. Finally, we are talking about suicide on this podcast as we do every week and as the title suggests it's not a great fit for everybody we know that so please take that into account before you listen or as you listen but i do hope you listen because there is so much to learn today i am talking with jess jess lives in wyoming and she is a suicide attempt survivor hey jess jess where are you i'm in wyoming do you know why that makes me happy because i'm your first you're the first from Wyoming, which means I think we only have like five or six other states. Um, now, you know, in Wyoming and perhaps states nearby, Montana, Idaho, I know they're not that close, but particularly with men, middle-aged men, they are offering themselves in huge numbers. This will be about you, but I must ask, is there something we should know about Wyoming that other than it's a weirdly shaped square state? They're all weird hicks here. They're all weird hicks. Including your nephews? No, I refuse to let them turn into Hicks. Respectfully to anyone who's a Hick who's listening It'd to be this. a hard one. There's a lot of social pressure there that makes people turn into things that we can't individually control much, but you're going to try. I'll try. I'll love them nonetheless, but I will try. Aunt Jess, who drives a, pol- a pilot, which kind of sounds funny, and is literally sitting in the front seat of said pilot, waiting to pick up her nephew from school, is talking with me, even though we tacitly agreed that we don't talk about this. I'm sitting in a bedroom, not in Wyoming. How do we talk about something that we don't talk about? It's a bit existential, but it's also a bit practical, Jess. Here's what I know about you. Your age doesn't matter, but you're young. You're youngish. You've got yeah. nephews, which means you have at least one sibling. You see, um, you have a car. You're in a, a conservative state by most people's metrics. Let's quickly improv and then we'll really get into it. When we say the S word, what are three things we're not referring to? Suicide, sex, and sleep. Now you're not my favorite improv partner. Uh, the S word we're talking about that you don't talk about is, could be sleep. Right. But it's not, because that's might be part of our conversation, but it could be sex. Even though in some circles, that's a little bit taboo. I'm going to add it, it. The S word could be sauerkraut. Maybe spaghetti. That's, that's all of those are on the table. We are trying to introduce something that is not commonly discussed, certainly not so candidly, which is uh, essentially at the heart of this project, podcast, call it what you want. Right. But yet you are in a, a huge minority of people that one, either attempted or came close, two, 
heard the podcast or heard about the podcast. Three, reached out to consider the possibility of joining me here on the podcast. Hang on, I'm not done, Jess. Four, showed up for said meeting. And finally, five, has not hung up or ended meeting. It's it's continuing to talk to me. The likelihood of this happening is is so low. I feel very fortunate. I won't hang up on you. Don't worry. Okay. I don't think anyone ever has. I promise. Well, one or two people, their Wi-Fi went out and maybe they were upset. But usually, always, 150 some conversations in now, uh, they're mostly good and sometimes hard. Yeah. Before I ask you about that stuff, I am curious, and I rarely start this way. I'm curious as to what your typical days are like. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I work 2 to 11. And on Tuesdays, so I have two sisters. They both have kids. One of them has three and the other one has two. The one that has two, I'm picking him up from school. But the one that has three, I watch her kids on Tuesday nights. I pick them up from daycare and I watch them from like four-ish till fuck at night. Hashtag awesome man. Okay. What kind of work do you do? I work at Walmart. Do you like it? Depends on the day and who I have to deal with. Do you really think Walmart executives are going to hear this conversation? (laughs) Don't worry. (laughs) It really does depend on the day. I love my coworkers. I love them so much. They're like a second family to me, but sometimes the coworker, not the coworkers, the customers only been threatened to be kidnapped once or twice. And what is the dream job? I wanted to write music. And now the conversation starts. What happened? I'm working on it. I actually have my guitar. I write music. Ooh, so you're a musician and songwriter, mostly sad and sappy. Yeah. Which I don't actually think is sad or sappy, but people might think of it as, right? Because right. I could hear a song that most people think is upbeat and happy, and it actually makes me feel like shit. So, you know, Jess, I have wanted to learn an instrument for a while, and I've tried it, guitar, and it's hard. It's okay. I didn't take lessons. I just taught myself. Now I dislike you a little bit, frankly, and oh. that might hurt your feelings. Oh. <laughs> but I'm envious. I live in a lot, a state of envy. You also are in a uh, somewhat not huge category, though, probably growing for better or worse. And most people would say worse of people who at one point in their lives, either try to end their lives, perhaps more than once. We're going to go against the grain and actually talk about the S word. What I want to know uh, is at some point, presumably in the past year, maybe the past month, you decide to search for something using the S word. I want to know what, about when that was and if you would share why that was. So I got COVID last year, right after Thanksgiving and right before Christmas. And I live alone. I live on my own. And I was just really depressed. I was like, I've tried multiple ways to end my life. We'll say it, suicide. But I was like, okay, I've tried so many different ways to kill myself. So we're just going to Google. So I went to TikTok. I went to Google. I went to... I I did not show up in TikTok. I did not show up in TikTok. No, I just Googled on like TikTok, on YouTube, on Google, on podcasts, like ways to commit suicide. And your podcast showed up. Hold up. Here we go. Okay. So just to be clear, because people have different intentions and reasons to look for it. Right. Yours wasn't so much like, I want to hear people's stories. Yours was, I want to end my life. That's not what we really do here, but mine showed, nonetheless, mine showed up. Yep. A month ago. Okay. So it didn't take long for you to listen to it and then email me. Yeah. Because you first wanted to look for ways to die. You don't need to email me for that. So. I genuinely feel like whoever hears this. Something they hear in it could be their guide to survival. Something I share of how I cope or something in my story they can relate to and it'll help them. So you're somebody who contemplates ending your life, but you're wanting others not to? I never, ever want anyone to feel the way that I felt, which I mean, obviously they do because this podcast exists. People share their stories like I've heard them. It breaks my heart knowing that these people feel those things. Obviously, I can't control it, but I'm like, that like makes me so sad for them. Do you think I might be a psychopath or a sociopath? Because I I wouldn't quite use the word breaks my heart when I hear it. And I mean it. But we're different. We're different. That's what makes us us. Do you remember the first time you thought about suicide? I do. So I got diagnosed with a neurological disorder. I have neurofibromatosis, which causes tumors to grow in the nerve brain and spinal cord. And I have 17 tumors. 18. 18 tumors. We found one the other day. I have 18 tumors. It's not cancerous but there's no cure. 
And I always like fell out of place with it. With it, like I have ADHD and I have learning disabilities and I have like all these other like issues that come with it. I always felt like I was never good enough. Like my dad always would like drill that into my head. Like, you're not really a good enough daughter. You're not this, you're not that. It always made me feel like I was failing. And then on top of that, I was being bullied at school. And so I was about like nine, I think. Yeah, I was nine. And I was like, I'm done. Before I even knew what suicide was, I was like, I'm done. I want to end it all. So I grabbed a steak knife out of the kitchen and I tried to kill myself. But my dad walked in. So you had no concept, movies, TV. This was just essentially, I don't want to be existing anymore. But you knew enough. I mean, nine's not that young. You knew enough. These are certain ways it might work. So you take a knife one day where you think nobody's home. Now, is that is that moment, and I use this word carefully because it's a tricky one, because clearly you've been dealing with a lot of stuff. You've been thinking about a lot of stuff. Moment a little impulsive or like you're walking home, you're like, no, 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 I'm going to go into the kitchen and I'm going to fucking kill myself. No, I had grabbed a knife and I had put it in there a couple of days before. And I was like, every night when I get home, I'd be like, today's the day. I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to end it. I'm going to end it all. But I'd always hear my dad, like my family's voice in the back of my head being like, that's being dramatic and asking for attention. So don't do that. So I couldn't. So the day I finally got the nerve to do it, I had like, I don't know if this is too dark. And if it is, you can edit it out. But I pierced skin and my dad walked in and I threw the knife across the room. And he was like, hey, kid, what are you doing? I'm like, nothing. I'm just hanging out. But like you could see, like I was bleeding and he was like, oh, okay, love you. Bye. You didn't try it on your wrists or your throat. You tried it on your heart. Yep. Because at that age, I knew if your heart stops or something happens to your heart, you die. So I was like, that'll be the quickest way to go. I used a steak knife. Oh man, you have so much to learn. What are they teaching you kids in Wyoming? Jeez. It wasn't raised here. My dad was in the military growing up. So I grew up all over the world. Oh, give me the places. So I was born in Colorado, and then we lived in California, then we lived in Italy, then we lived in Texas, then we lived back in Colorado, and now we're here. And when, where were you when you were nine? I was in uh, Texas. Family's in Texas, dad walks out of the room, you're bleeding, steak knife is somewhere over there. <laughs> By the way, with those tumors, it's so not fatal, but has created many, many problems that in part led to a suicide attempt. Impossible to know had you not had that uh, condition or illness, what might have happened. That's magic wand stuff. I will ask, outside of the specific or arguably measurable things like that, you did say stuff around bullying. Family life was not ideal. Nope. Not a hard judgment on the dad, but that was just an interesting choice he made. I don't know what his day was like in that moment, but that's just an interesting thing to say and then thing to do. He's still to this day, like, I remember my parents got divorced right after I graduated high school and my therapist was like, write him a really long letter, call him out on all of his shit. So I did. I was like, dad, you literally walked into my room in sixth grade when I tried to kill myself and you did nothing. And he read that. And he's like, what are you talking about? No, you didn't. You didn't try to kill yourself. Is it possible he didn't realize what it was or really has forgotten? I is oblivious and didn't really care. I want to deal with the hard stuff. Right. That's the through line for all of it. Yeah. And your mom was either attracted to that or it wasn't a deal breaker. No, she loved us more that she just put up with it my whole life. Like she put up with my dad my whole life because she's like, I have to do this for my kids. He's the military guy. That fits a stereotype, fair or not. Yep. You're moving around some for better or worse, probably worse. Oh, worse. Settle in Wyoming when? When I was in eighth grade. So that point, one attempt. Yeah, there'd be times where I'd like really think about it as a kid. Did you get any help? Nope. No medication, no doctors, no counselors, no therapists, no no group support, not a lot at home. Okay, one attempt. Other things you're doing that I guess we could broadly call self-harm? Nope, not at this point yet. I kind of just shoved it back. I'd always just hear my dad's voice in the back of my head. You're being dramatic. Don't do that. Yeah. You're fine. You have a good when, life. And when did you so, first pick up the guitar? Freshman year of high school how to play the guitar and i wrote a song about my tumors and i've just been writing music since uh so we get into ninth grade and beyond and you not only pick up the guitar but i believe is where uh it sounds like things get more even more difficult so at this point school's hard lack of better words i'm stupid like i wasn't stupid but school things like i could hear what they were teaching but i couldn't understand it 
And mm-hmm. so I like felt stupid and I didn't felt like I really belonged in this family. And it always felt like every day when I'd come home from dance or I'd come home from cheer, or I'd come home from track or my like after school activities, I'd like walk in this door and I felt this like weight just be put onto my shoulders. Like you're not good enough to be in this family. You're a failure to them. You shouldn't be alive anymore. Just end it all and save them. Lack of better words, I didn't have the balls to kill myself. There's like obviously been times where I was like, nope, I'm going to do it. I have the balls now. I'm going to just end it all. But like, I would just be like, can I just, the next tumor I grow, can it just be in my brain and it be cancer and it kill me? Or, oh, it's snowing. Let me just swerve off the road and fall into a ditch and die. I really struggled with self-harm freshman year. Like throughout high school, I punched a lot of trees and my house My mom would be like, hey, can you make dinner tonight? And I'd be like, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. So I'd put something in the oven. And when I'd go to pull it out, I'd like stick my forearm on the rack. And I'd be like, ah, crap. That was an accident. I didn't mean to do that. Shucks. My bad. Or I'd like curl my hair for church and I'd burn my neck and be like, gosh, dang me. I'm so bad with hot tools. And your mom, neither parent ever even says, can we talk for a sec? Nope. My brother. Nope. None of them. They're living their own lives. I'm not justifying it. People get busy. Yeah. Who the fuck knows what's going on? All right. Yeah. Now, it should say what's interesting is that you'd have these after school activities, which tells me maybe I'm wrong. You know, you're doing some things that either bring some modicum, some something. Yeah. Um, or I take piano lessons and like I did all these things because like I wanted to like almost feel like I, if I like did all these things and acted like I was okay, then they wouldn't question it. And I wouldn't get a, you're going to hell if you do that. When people say uh, or threaten or whatever else, something about hell, this brings in a a new dynamic to the conversation. Because I assume, unless they're using it somewhat colloquially, that your family is a a church-going group. I grew up LDS. How do we we not talk about that yet? Most common in Utah, if I'm not mistaken, right? The biggest. LDS, uh, uh, Church of Latter-day Saints. But the threat of of hell was real. Yep. A kid that I went to high school with committed suicide. And I heard like this big debacle, like the kids that I went to school with, they were like, we want to do a balloon launch. And like, they wanted like tie chicken nuggets to the bottom of it and let it go because chicken nuggets were his favorite thing. Like, or at graduation that year, they had another girl in that grade that committed suicide and the one that got a car accident. So they wanted a bit cherubs in remembrance of them. And the principal was like, absolutely not. That's supporting suicide. So I went home. Like at this point I was struggling. Like I like wanted to die. And I went home and I told my mom, I'm like, mom, I'm so freaking mad because like, they just want to do something for these people that they love so much. And she's like, no, I agree with the principal. If you commit suicide, you're going to hell. Okay. I'll go into hell then. See you later. I'm going to refrain from commenting because once in a while I do say things that I'm thinking that was a bit much, but I think you know where I'm going. (laughs) So you're around it some, you've tried once. You're around it some. People around you have died that way. Yep. You've mentioned earlier that you have several attempts in your life. Uh, You're not that old. Nope. So where does the next one come in? After I graduated. You got through high school. Yeah. But think about it a lot. I had this journal that all the deepest, darkest thoughts, my bad words that I wasn't allowed to say, I'd write in them. Like, I'd be like, I just want to fucking die. Wasn't allowed to say that out loud. So I'd write them in this journal And I was at cheer practice my junior year and my mom found it. And my parents gave me the good cop, bad cop lecture. Who was the good cop? Dad, don't do that, Jess. That hurts my heart. Just don't struggle. Just don't. Make a choice and be a good girl. Choose better. Okay, I will. I'm sorry. I didn't know that was an option. Thank you, Mama. Now, what about dad? That was dad. Dad was the good cop. That was dad good cop. And mom was... This is just dramatic. You're going to go to hell if you do these things. Like, you're fine. You have a good life. You have a good family. You have a home. You have a good school. You have a good education. Are you allowed to journal things like that? Won't God find out? Yep. So you're taking a risk. And it means you're really in pain. Yeah. I honestly, at that point of my life, too, like, when I was a kid, all I ever wanted, like, besides being a musician, if you asked me when I was, like, four or five, what do you want to be when you grow up? I was like, a mom. have kids. I want to be a mom and I want to love kids to the ends of the earth. Like that's all I ever wanted for as long as I can remember, but I can't have kids because of this disease. And so I was always like, why would God do that to me? Obviously he doesn't love me. So when I was journaling, I was like, you don't care about me. I don't care about you. Cool. Cool. We'll, we'll, we'll probably circle back to this, but 
Do you think there's an overarching sort of narrative here of the main reason you want to die is because you can't have kids? Yep. One more question about parents in LDS. Forgive me. Okay. I forgive you. LDS is a religion and is Jesus Christ its God? So I'm getting too churchy. Like, you know how the Holy Trinity is like a triangle? Barely. Right. So it's not like that, but we believe there's three beings, but they're separate. So there's Jesus Christ, Heavenly Father, and God. Now, could we also agree, you see that these are going to be somewhat loaded questions, that there are certain ways of being, ways of thinking, ways of behaving that they would all agree on, like or, or all not agree on. Like one is, all of them agree you can't murder people. All of them agree you can't assault people. There's probably some overlap with some other religions with that. Yeah. Because there's sort of these like big universal human things that we mostly agree on. What I want to know to any of those three, the question I want to ask is when you have a son or daughter who's in pain, is the way your mother spoke to you in the spirit of her religion? Yeah. Why, why, why do I feel like pushing back? I definitely feel like I love my mom. I love my mom to the ends of the earth. Kind of glad she won't be here in this podcast. I feel like with her though, like when we found my tumors, I how I explained it as a child, so we're backtracking a little bit. I was at church and I fell off a water heater. I was playing with my friends and I fell off of it and my stomach hurt. And we all thought, oh, she fell off. She just landed on her stomach. But how I explained it was I thought I broke my stomach. Like how you break bones. I thought you broke, I broke my stomach. I felt like someone was like hammering me in the gut with a hundred hammers repeatedly over and over again. It's how that pain felt. And my mom was like, you're fine. Like you'll be fine in the morning. But I wasn't cried all night. I didn't sleep. And they took me to the hospital the next day and they're like, she has a tumor. I feel like it's the same way with my depression and like suicide attempts and like health, self-harm and anxiety is there's not like physical, like, oh, her stomach hurts. There's a tumor inside of her. We have proof. There's no physical evidence and proof of depression and anxiety other than just being sad. And with that, it's like, just get over it. You're fine. Pray. Goes to church. Ask Jesus for help. You're fine. So the way you interpreted my question was because you could pray and maybe get better, her response was aligned with the values. Right. My take, and it's also more, maybe just a completely different perspective. It doesn't feel like, and I'm, I'm sure she's a wonderful human being and a, and a good mom. And I was under the impression that God, almost any religion's God, is all about love more than anything else. The thing that I guess I'm stuck on is that was her way of expressing love. Oh, yeah. But could you argue there comes a point where that's no longer acceptable? Because yeah. if I say to you, my way of loving you and is teaching you in the world that life is hard, so I have to hit you, where do we draw the line? Yeah. Sorry, in this particular case, make that a little bit about your mom. That's okay. What or how would you have wanted either of your parents to engage with you? Honestly, I wouldn't have wanted my dad to be a part of it at all. But my mom, I wish she would have just hugged me and listened without the judgment of it. I wish she would have just listened and been like, well, I want to understand what you're going through. I want to help you. Mm. You know what that weirdly reminds me of what you just said, hugging and wanting to listen and understand? Mm. God. Yeah. I mean, some people call me a poet, Jess. So what do you want me to do? Point made. I'll move on. Take us through. Not that the attempts are necessarily like the anchor points, but just give me a little context too. When you're out of high school, are you... Dad was gone at this point. Dad had left us for another woman, moved to Iowa. He'd been with her since my junior year of high school. Not the only woman he had been with. Explains my entire childhood. I watched him leave. I watched my parents last fight and I watched him pack up his bags and leave. And then I started dating this boy. He was not the greatest. He was very narcissistic and controlling. He made me sign a contract. LDS? Yeah. Would you date outside or no? Was that just no? No. Please tell me what's in the contract if you're okay with that. I still have it. I can read it to you. You have it in the car? No, I have it on my phone because I like to look at it sometimes and laugh because I'm like, he's a piece of shit. I am never going back to that again. Okay. And where is he now? He is in Mexico. All right. So you start dating him before he leaves to Mexico. I was emotionally exhausting and the thought of marrying me made me nauseous. So we broke up. He would like sexually assault me, but I would tell him no. And he would tell me that I'm going to get mad. You need to leave. And that fear of when I would make my dad mad and he would get angry would kick back in. I was like, no, I have to make him happy. So he doesn't hit me. 
or throw me at walls. Did you, ha- was there a risk again of being sort of shunned for talking about the truth? Don't be so dramatic. Oh yeah. Uh, he would tell me things like that too. Like, oh, your dad left a week ago. You're fine. Stop crying. You've been praying for this forever. Like, doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. How long were you two together? 11 months. How long in was the first assault? We weren't even dating at that point. We had been talking for two weeks. And then I started to date him because he made my family happy. I didn't care about me. I was like, if I'm miserable and treated like shit, who cares? He makes my family happy. That's all I care about. I'm going to ask you a question. I've never asked anybody on this podcast and you may not like it or it may feel a little insensitive. So please say, I prefer not to answer that. But my goal is not to make you feel awkward. In your entire time with this young man, did you ever have one intimate experience that was at least at a minimum not unpleasurable? Like once. Okay. Just getting some context. For most people, the goal is it for at a, at, a, at, a, at a minimum to be not unpleasurable, ideally. Right. 11 months later, he's not with you anymore. And in that time, can I guess two things? One, you, you ideate fairly often. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you try again? Uh, I would try drowning myself. Wait, what? I would try drowning myself in the bathtub. So at some point, maximum 90 seconds, you get out of the water. Yeah. And then I get dressed and I go to bed. And you're still alive. Yeah. And you had just wanted to not be alive. What's that like? It kind of sucked. Kind of hated it. But then after him, I started dating a new boy. LDS. Surprise! I see a pattern emerging. Genuinely, the love he showed me in the beginning. It was like, is this how I'm supposed to be loved? Yeah, right. There's a word for that, but we won't go into it. You're right. But I'd always be like, I don't know if I'm supposed to feel this kind of love. I don't know if I deserve it. It's a fucked up, but I love it. Yeah. Like, I don't know if I should be feeling this kind of love. And, then and you're, and you're tw- what, 19 or 20 years old? I was 20 at the time. Are you in college? Are you working? No, I'm living with my mom still. And I was working with adults with disabilities at this time. Very cool. Yeah. Where'd you meet this guy? On a Mormon dating app. Wait, wait go back. Wait, where'd you meet the first guy? Uh, we went to high school together. Right. He was a Wolverine also? Yep. Now, please... I can't wait for what I'm about to hear. <laughs> Please tell me. I No, before you tell me the name of the Mormon dating app, I want to guess. Just tell me this. And don't give it away until we're ready. Please. Okay. One word, two words, three words in the, in the whole title. One. Like, for example, like Tinder, like Bumble. Yeah. And I need you in the audience to know that in these moments, I, I'm getting more aware of my life of the joy that I have rushing through my whole fucking body and soul. I can't tell you why. <laughs> my g- guess number one, more love. No. Close? No. It uh, starts with the right letter. Is it one syllable, two, or more? Two. Yeah. This is going to be the defining moment of this podcast's history right here. This is where we fucking go vi- viral finally. I'm telling you, <laughs> we're breaking <laughs> barriers and we're crossing into new worlds. Is it geared yeah. for women to find men, men to find women, or, or both? Both. More mom. Mom. No. And I think I'm getting caught on the MOR. And is it wise for me to not go in that direction? Yeah. Is this as joyful? Is this as fun for you as it is for me? Because it doesn't yeah. look like it is. I don't awesome. have like a hint I could give you. And you might. Oh, well, no, because I, I, I know because it's probably going to be, they're usually spelled a little weirdly so that they can get the domain like M Y or mnemonic, like an M N. And you're like, but because you said there was two syllables, mistletoe. No, scratch that. I want to take that back. Okay, you can take it back. Can, all right, give me one hint without giving it away. I'm a little disappointed in myself. How much do you know about the Mormon church? Everything you just told me. Okay, so the name of the app is the same thing that when you're a youth, between the ages of 12 and 18, you go to this on Wednesday nights. Mission? Nope. Because that's what your ex is doing. Yeah, and he's over 18. I, I blew it. Go. Mutual. That's a good name. It is. And you found this dude and he was super great and your family probably liked him too. They never met him. He actually was at in going to school in Utah at this time. And I actually met my best friend through him who also met him on mutual. He was going to school in Utah and then he got his mission call. So he went back to Utah, North Dakota, which is where he's from. So I flew out there twice to see him before he went on his mission, which is why my family's never met him. Where's his mission? He was in Guatemala. He came home 10 days after I broke up with him. Sounds like there's a lot of things going on in Latin America with respect to the missions. (laughs) Respectfully. You're not wrong. 
I'm not wrong. You no. broke up with him. Why? Did he do something problematic or you just grew apart? So that's when my depression got really bad. He left on his mission and I was still head over heels, loved him, saw the moon in his eyes. And he just slowly pulled away. I got really depressed, which is common for girls who are waiting for missionaries. I lost 45 pounds in the first month he was gone. Wow. He'd be like, no, I want to know these things you're struggling with. So I tell him, I'd be like, babe, I lost 45 pounds and you've only been gone six weeks. And he's like, okay. And I'd always felt like he didn't love me enough or so you get a P day when you're on a mission, which is like personal day, preparation day. And it's whatever day of the week. Like I have a different friend who's on a mission and his is on Monday, but my ex-boyfriend's was on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. So I talked to Wednesdays and he would never talk to me. He like would say, hi, I'm alive. And that's it every single week. And it like killed me because I'm like, I need more. Like, do you still love me? That's when I would start self-harming because I always felt the need to punish myself because I wasn't being a good enough girlfriend for him. This is where we were clever. Okay. <laughs> I shouldn't joke about that. I'm sorry. But you know, those metal springy thingies that you use to clean your pots and pans. That's what I would use. I would like scrape my legs and my arms with it. He didn't know about that. Oh, he knew. And he was just like, okay, don't do that. That sucks. When did you leave the guy? I left him July 4th. 2022? Mm -hmm. But my attempt was the month before, and that was my breaking point. I tried to OD on pills. Third method. Yep. I'd finally gotten help. I had gone to see a, at my doctor, and I was like, I'm really sad all the time, and I don't want to be sad anymore. So she prescribed me Lexapro for my depression. And she was like, go see a psychiatrist, though, to like actually diagnose you. But we're going to give you this, and we're going to give you hydroxyzine to help with when you're like anxious and you can't like calm mm -hmm. down, saw a psychiatrist and he diagnosed me with severe major reoccurring depression. Do you agree? Yes. After that, I had gone to work the next day. It was a Saturday. I'd gone home and I had poured four or five of my Lexapro pills, four or five of the hydroxyzine, my Adderall, all of it, all of the pills I could. I poured them in my hand and something in me was like, you need to call your best friend. Mm. So I called her and I was like, Babe, okay, I call her babe. I was like, babe, I'm going to die. I have the pills in my hand, but I don't want to take them, but I feel like I have to. And I don't know what she said. I genuinely do not remember. I like blacked out at this moment, but somehow she convinced me to drive to the hospital. So I drove to the hospital and I checked myself in. I think part of it was like me calling her to say goodbye, but I was too scared to tell her because I didn't want her to hurt. I think I was like, if I call her, and talk to her, and then I just hang up, then she'll have that last moment with me. Yeah. You go to the hospital. And I'm like, if you don't do something right now, I'm going to go home and I'm going to actually kill myself. What? Well, how did that person respond in that moment? They were like, okay, can you fill out your form or do you need someone to do it for you? I was like, mm -hmm. I can't do it. Like, it's like, I can do it. It's okay. So I filled it out. They texted me in and I was there till the next morning. And I talked to a psychiatrist and they talked about putting me into a mental hospital, one that's three hours away from here. It was like a counseling center. So I'd stay up there. They do like the evaluation and then I'd stay up there and they had it all set. They had a bed picked for me, you know, whatever. I'd even texted my mom while I was in the hospital. I was like, mom, I try to OD on pills. I'm okay. I'll keep you updated. I'll just want you to know I'm in the hospital. And she's wow. like, do you need to come up? And I was like, no, I'm good. And so she was like, okay, well, keep me updated. So then the next day was Sunday. I went to church and then we went out to my grandparents for dinner. Then I told her they're checking me into a mental hospital. You were allowed to leave that one facility before you went to the other one. Because I voluntarily yeah. admitted. I would have thought you were going to kill yourself if it were me, frankly. Yeah. Okay. You didn't. I convinced them I was fine. That's the thing we do. Yeah. No, it's like live, laugh, love. We're okay. I just wanted attention. You were being so dramatic, weren't you? Obviously. Obviously. You get out of that place, you're with some family, and there's possible plans of you going to this counseling center that's far away that I assume you'd be staying at for several days or longer, but you don't go. No, because my mom told me I couldn't because I was being dramatic. At this point, you've got a medical professional who are saying you should go, at least one or two, I assume, right? Yep. And she was like, so how it had worked, the facility, they were like, because I had like called them and talked to them because I was voluntarily admitting myself. They were like, so you will have to drive down, have someone bring you, and then we will bring you home at the end of your stay. 
So I was like, okay, I just need to find a ride. My mom's like, well, I'm not driving you. And you're not asking anyone in our family for help. And so I had asked a couple friends and they couldn't. They were like, we want to, but I'm literally going to be out of town at like my grandma's funeral or going to be somewhere else at something else. I literally cannot. And I was too terrified to ask anyone else because I was like, hey, I'm struggling and I want to die. I'm getting help. Can you drive me? Can I ask you two questions? I'm, I'm hung up on your mom. Sorry. I want to ask you a question about your mom. I just want to understand this thing she keeps talking about with being dramatic. I, I'm not a therapist or a shrink or a counselor. And I think a lot of that's kind of psycho babble. But do you have any idea why she is like that? I definitely think that that was her parents. Like her parents were very much so like that for her growing up. You stayed for one day in the one place. Then you never made it to the other place. And that was uh, shortly before Mr. What was it? Central America was no longer in your life. Yep. Your choice, that was six, seven months ago, summer 2022. You're obviously still with us. What's it been like since? Um, It's hard. There was another attempt. That one was 100 days ago. Wait, wait, wait. There's a coincidence that we're talking at the 100-day mark? Mm-hmm. New, different, and fourth method? Or did you go back to an old one? No, I tried risks, but I didn't go deep enough. And so I went to the hospital again. Same one? Uh, No, my cousin actually drove me and we went to a hospital 30 minutes away. I was there for a couple of hours and they were like mean. They were like, you're fine. Just get over it. Oh, but they didn't also accuse you of being dramatic? Oh, they did. They're like, you're fine. Like quit being dramatic. Get over it. it. Is there anywhere you can go to get help? Um, I see a therapist now. When you mentioned a therapist, then when did you start seeing therapists for the first time? A therapist. Right after I graduated high school and my dad left. But this is a different therapist? Yeah. And you said that you had been on meds. Mm-hmm. I'm getting the sense that you stopped or are you on meds? Uh, no, I quit taking them. I decided I was over them. You take meds for your other condition? So I also have this thing where I like just throw up. Which I also was another form of self-harm that I had. I would make myself throw up. Now I just do it uncontrollably. I just make myself, like, I don't make myself throw up. It just happens. Promise if that happens right now, I will cut it out of the uh, podcast. I didn't eat, so I won't throw up. I promise. How many people in the world know uh, that we're talking? Um, My best friend does, and she will be listening to this podcast. She told me to send it to her when I'm done um, and when it's out. And I have another friend. And he wants to listen to it when it's out. All LDS? One of my best friends. She used to be LDS, but she left the church. And the guy is still LDS. He just got off his mission. From? He served in Colorado. And so you left the hospital. And then if we we can kind of flash forward and now we're talking. Yeah. And then I left the hospital the second time. Really? I mean, I found my people. Like, it's still hard. Wait, who are your people? My best friends. Oh, that was recent? Mm Mm-hmm. Are you vaping? Dude, you're not LDS. That's allowed. Of course that's it's allowed, allowed, but you're not Mormon at this point. You're breaking too many fucking rules. And you said earlier that you still want to meet somebody. So men out there uh, in Wyoming and perhaps willing to travel, though, probably not too far because she's got Call me. A, a job and a nephew. Um, Jess in Wyoming is available, Hello. but she's picky. Let's just know that. But I'm Do, nice. Do you wish that any of those attempts had worked? All of them. As we speak right now. Oh, yeah. Just Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not doing this to make you feel guilty. Family, nephews, who I bet you're pretty, pretty cool with your nephews. Two friends, you're actively on dating websites. And your answer to my question was you wish all, I believe, four had worked and you had died. Yep. And had you died, would you be where? In hell. Because? Because I took my own life. It wasn't like natural where where do we draw the line with natural i caused my own death i didn't like get cancer and die or i didn't oh so if i get hit by a car i'm not wearing my seatbelt i'm going to heaven if i got cancer because i'm smoking i'm going to heaven no so if i go outside too long without sun protection over 50 years and i get skin cancer and die i'm not going to heaven how the, the fuck mormon. do you get into heaven yeah in the mormon stamps be perfect okay, okay i'm done I'm not, kidding, not with you. I just, I can't. I'll, I'll ask some people I meet on Mutual. How's that? Because maybe I, I just can't. Uh, if they say, dude, my age single, they're going to be like, stay away from that guy. That motherfucker's dangerous. <laughs> like, that is what a serial killer looks like. Leave now. Swipe any direction other than the one you're supposed to. 
How many people in your life do you have, and we're not including your therapist in this particular for this particular question, to talk to about difficult things? My best friend. Of your four attempts, how many people know about all of them? She does. And my therapist and you. I'm in good company. Other than vaping and your nephew and music, what helps? The rest of my nephews, my best friend, not church. Oh, yeah. No, that's what I was expecting. Not church. Okay. What are you, 21, 22, 23? I'm 21. When's your birthday? June 27th. Cancer. That's me. Me too. July 4th. Oh. Not the day you try to kill yourself. Thanks for that, Jess. Not taking it personally. Um, you do know that the mascot of the University of Wyoming is the Cowboys, I assume. Yes, sir. So you're 21. Late June 2023, you'll be 22. Say that five times fast. Will you be alive for that birthday? I hope so. I hope so, but I don't know what tomorrow's promised. Like, I'm mentally, I'm okay today. Like, I'm doing pretty good, but that doesn't mean I'll wake up tomorrow and still want to be alive. Like, my goal with therapy is to learn to get... I mean, obviously, I know depression is never cured. It's never going to be cured. But I'm hoping I can get to a point where I can cope with it better than I have been. Where I can learn the tools that when I want to kill myself, I can do this instead and it will help me. That's my goal. You know, when people meet people, for, you know, dating and it's awkward, especially online, how and when do I tell them this thing? It's big, but it might be too soon and yada, yada, yada. I, I'm totally good being wrong, but is your big thing, I can't have kids. Yep. And is number two, like way lower down? Yep. My depression and my anxiety is way lower down. Is that on your profile? Do you actually let people know in advance? No, I usually hold off telling them that one for a while. Let them figure it out on themselves, on their own. Just kidding. A lot, a, lot, a lot of people would have quit anything related to God. And I did. So what brought you back? Uh, my friend that is on a mission right now. Where is she? He is in Japan. He loves it. He comes home in two months. Is he, is he a potential? No. It's only audio. Don't worry. I only say it like that because he'll probably want to listen when he comes home. It's a podcast. He can listen anywhere in the world. He can't on his mission. You can't listen to podcasts on the mission. What can you do? Go to church and teach about Jesus. And basic bodily functions, I assume. Yep. I'm pretty sure a lot of those dudes are breaking some of those things, but we don't need to talk about that. Someone from the church might be listening. So do you have any myths around any of the stuff you want to dispel? When people are genuinely depressed, it's not asking for attention. It's not an attention-seeking thing. Like, I mean, obviously there are those exceptions, but there are genuinely people out there who are seriously depressed and seriously want to die. And hearing things like that doesn't help. They just want help and they want to be heard and they want to, like, it takes a lot. As someone who's depressed, it takes a lot for me to open up to someone and say, hey, I'm really not okay. That's the big myth. Yeah, that was my story. Well, thanks for telling it. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. Um, Enjoy your nephews. Enjoy those other things, though there aren't many. But mostly thank you very much for joining me and talking with me and being open. And you know, if you've heard the podcast, I'm always an awkward and weird when these things are over. So I'll just say thank you very, very much. And we'll talk soon. Oh, of course. Thank you. Bye, Jess. Take care. Be Bye. safe. Ciao. You too. As always, thanks so much for listening and all of your support. Special thanks to Jess out in Wyoming. Thank you, Jess. If you are a suicide attempt survivor and you'd like to talk, please reach out. Hello at SuicideNoted.com on Facebook or Twitter at Suicide Noted. And check the show notes for all kinds of other things, including another way you can reach out to us and information on our membership. We would love your support if that's something you can and want to do. That is all for episode number 155. Stay strong. Do the best you can. I'll talk to you soon.